This organic coffee costs $28 and this regular coffee costs $5. Now in this video, I'll explain why I'm sticking with the cheap stuff. I try to buy organic when it comes to fruit, vegetables, and grains, because it's almost impossible to wash those pesticides and herbicides off here. I also avoid any produce coated with the appeal product, which is content for another video. But what about coffee? Now I make a triple espresso in a stainless steel pot every morning with a regular cheap dark roast non-organic espresso. Now you can find a lot of literature online, mostly from organic coffee makers, warning about pesticides, mold, and acrylamide in commercial coffees. However, their coffee can be five times more expensive than their non-organic competitors. So again, here are the reasons why I'm sticking with the regular cheap stuff. Number one, most coffees grown in countries that do allow a variety of herbicides and pesticides, actually quite a bit. Organic crops are, the, are often actually grown next to the commercial crops. So they're also exposed to some extent to the same chemicals and the spraying process, as well as to the groundwater. So organic crops will contain a certain amount of these toxins as well. But more importantly, before roasting, the coffee bean is removed from the outer fruit and then roasted at very high temperatures, which removes or destroys the vast majority of any chemical uh, residuals on there. A 2015 publication in the Journal of Agriculture and Food Chemistry found that washing of coffee beans showed up to 58% reduction in these pesticides and herbicides, while the roasting process reduced up to 99.8%. Chlorpyrifos, ethyl, permethrin, cypermethrin, endosulfan, alpha, and beta in the roasting, and all of the 12 pesticides in the coffee brewing process were not detected anymore. Now, so essentially, the roasting really gets rid of all these things. And if there's some residues there, it'll just burn off. I mean, so most of the stuff is just completely gone by the time it enters these uh, containers here. Number two, mold and fungi can form on green coffee during storage. But this is unfortunately also true for organic beans. The companies say that they can take extra precaution to prevent mold forming, but you know, I'd like to see the evidence of that. Um, now, wet processing and then the high temperatures during roasting get rid of most of these um, contaminations. So again, something that I'm not super concerned about. A study published in Food Research in 2019 titled Prevalence of Spoilage Mold in Coffee Before and After Brewing um, highlighted that the very low levels of spoilage mold that was recovered after brewing may not pose any significant health risk. Point number three, acrylamide. Now, acrylamide is a chemical produced in the roasting process, and this is regardless of the type of coffee being used. So you will have it in the expensive organic coffee, and you will have it in your regular cheap brew. It's in, it's in all of these present, right? It can be produced when plants that contain the amino acid asparagine are heated to very high temperatures in the presence of sugar. It is present in higher amounts in white bread and in French fries. These are actually the worst offenders, right? Acrylamide consumption has been shown to cause cancer in rodent models, and this is important to consider here. Now, rodents, again, different than humans, and this uh, is something in humans we have not really studied uh, long-term high exposure of acrylamide. Of course, there's ethical reasons why we can't do that. Rodents might also respond a bit different to it. It is a toxin. There's no question about it. We don't want a lot of it. But how much of a problem it is is actually difficult to determine at this point, right? A 2020 publication in Nutrients brought up the following interesting point. The authors write here, furthermore, the consumption of coffee, which is a main contributor of dietary acrylamide exposure, actually decreases the overall incidence of cancer in humans and afford global health benefits, including both lifespan and health span on aging. This paradox clearly illustrates the risk of evaluating an individual molecule, like acrylamide, independently of its complex food matrix, which may have other components that completely override the effects of the considered molecule. And I think this is very important. Sometimes we can't just isolate a molecule, give it in a huge amount to rodents and say, here, it causes cancer there, so it's bad. If this molecule is in a package with other molecules, first of all, how do they interact with each other? How much does this individual molecule pose a risk to humans? These are all things that are not very clear. And I think these studies need to really highlight that, right? Also, there was a 2020 study in Turkey that found that the amounts in coffee of acrylamide are negligible for health, and they do drink a lot of coffee in Turkey. So again, overall, when we look at coffee, I think there's a lot of uh, net benefit. There's also some things that are not so good. It is certainly a diuretic. You know, there's other issues in the roasting process. As we mentioned, uh, molecules like acrylamide can form. Um, if you keep, in my opinion, your coffee consumption uh, within limits, like, you know, this means anywhere from two to four cups a day, I think it's absolutely fine. Even during pregnancy, we've seen that this does not necessarily have a negative effect. You should always talk to your GYN then, but 
from all the studies that I've looked at, even in pregnancy, we have not found the deleterious effect to the developing baby if the mother consumes a few cups of coffee per day. Also, keep in mind that a cup of coffee contains more antioxidants than a bowl of flint. 